Astounding Stories, 19 July 1931 The Revolt of the Machine by Nat Sachsner and Arthur L. Scott, Part 1 Something in the manifested mind of the master machine spurs it into diabolical revolt against the authority of its human masters. For five thousand years since that night legendary figure Einstein wrote and taught in the far off means of time, the scientists and the force reduced life and the universe to terms of a mathematical formula, and they thought they had succeeded. Throughout the world, machines did the work of man, and the aristos of nerves of the machines played in the soft idleness in their crystal and gold pleasure cities. Even the prolet horse, relief of all but an hour or two per day of toil, were content in their warrants, content with the crumbs of their masters. Then the eyes began to move, down from the north and up from the south. Slowly, inexorably, the jaws of the great vice closed, till all that was left of the wide empire of man was a narrow belt about the equator. Everywhere else was a vast tumbled waste of cold and glaring whiteness, a frozen desert. In the narrow habitable belt were compacted the teeming millions of Earth's people. In spite of the best efforts of the scientists among them, the crowding together of the myriads of Earth's inhabitants brought in its train and inevitable plagues of famine and disease. Even with the most intensive methods of cultivation, even with the synthetic food factories running day and night, there could not be produced enough to sustain life in the hordes of prolats, and with the lowering of resistance and the lack of sufficient sanitary arrangement, disease began to spread with ever-increasing rapidity and virulence. The aristos trembled, for there were few and the prolats many. Already were rising loud and disheveled orators inciting the millions to rise against their masters. The aristos were few, but they were not helpless. In the blackness of a moonless, clouded night there was a whispering of many wings, and from dark shapes that loomed against the dark sky. Great beams swept over the tented fields where the prolats lay huddled and sleeping. And when the red sun circled the ice-chained earth, he found in his path heaps of dust where on his last journey he had warmed the swarming millions. The slave thus ruthlessly destroyed could will be spared, for the machines did the work of the world, even to the personal care of the aristos' pampered bodies. Only for direction and sorting and stopping was the brain and the hand of man required. Now that the inhabited portion of the terrestrial globe was so straightly circumscribed, radio power waves, television and radio phone rendered feasible the control of all the machines from one central station. Built at the edge of the northern glacier, here were brought the scant few of the prolats that had been spared, a pitiful four hundred men and women, and they were set to endless, thankless tasks. I was one of the few, and Keston, my friend, who was set at the head of the force, I was second in command. For a decade we labored, whipped our fellows to their tasks, that the aristos might loll careless in the perfume and souls of their pleasure palace or riot in wild gravel. To sing at last in sudden stupor, sparled thus they would lie, until the dressing machines we guided would lift them gently from their demolished couch, bathe them with warm and fragrant waters, clothe their soft carcasses in their phones, iridescent webs, and start them on a new day of debauchery. But the slow vengeance of an inscrutable omnipotence they mockingly denied overtook them at last, and I saw the rendering and payment of the long past due account. As I entered the vast doom hall wherein all my waking hours were spent, the shrill whistle of an alarm signal told me that something had been wrong. Instinctively, I looked toward the post of Abbott. Three times in the past week had Keston or I been called upon for swift action to right some errors of that dull-witted prolat. On the oval visor screen above the banquet buttons of his station, I saw the impending catastrophe. Two great freight planes, one bearing the glowing red star that told of its cargo of highly explosive terminite, were approaching head-on with lightning rapidity. The fool had them on the same level. Abbott was gaping now at the screen in paralyzed fright, with no idea of how to avoid the cataclysm. Just below I glimpsed the soaring towers of Antarctica. In a moment that gold and crystal pleasure city would be blasted to extinction, with all its sleeping thousands, of course. 
Swift would be the vengeance of the aristos. Already I could see Abbott and Keston and a hundred others melting in the fierce rays of the death bath. But even as my face blanched with the swift and terrible vision, the little control scorer ground to a smoking stop at Abbott's back. With one motion, Keston's light form leaped from his seat and thrust aside the gaping prolet. His long white fingers dart deftly over the gleaming buttons. The red stirred plane banged in sudden swerve, the other deep beneath. Distinct from the speaker beneath the screen came the woos of the riven air as the flyers flashed fast, save by a margin of scan feet. Another rippling play of the prolet chief fingers and the planes were back on their proper courses. The whistle ceased its pressing alarm, left a throbbing stillness. Steve Keston turned to the brute-faced culprit, cold contempt out in the thin, ascetic fairness of his face. Somehow I was at his side. I must have been running across the white floor of the control station while this crisis had flared and passed. In measured tones, each word of a cutting whip last came his well-merited rebuke. Don't try me too far, Abbott. Long before this, I should have relieved you of your post and ordered you to the death bath. I am derelict in my duty that I do not do so. By my weak leniency, I imperil the relief of your comrades and my own. It is your good fortune that a council delegate has not been present at one of your exhibitions. But I dare not risk more. Let the warning whistle come from your station just once again. I, I shall report you as an incompetent. You know the law. I looked to see the man cring in abasement and contrition, but the heavy jaw thrust forth in truculent defiance had blazed forth from the deep-set eyes. The florid features were empurpled with rage. He made as if to reply but turned away from the withering scorn in Cassin's face. Ha! Huh, Maron, here at last. A warm smile greeted me. I have been waiting for you impatiently. I am an hour before my time. I replied, then continued exasperately. See if I hope this latter's imbecility will convince you that you ought to turn him in. I know it hurts you to condemn a prolet to the death bath, but if you let him go on, his mistakes will bring us all to that end. I glanced toward where a black portal broke the circle of switchboards and soldered. Behind that grim gate leaped and flared eternally the flame of the consuming ray. The exhaust flew of the solar energy by which the machines were fed. Once I had seen a condemned man step through that aperture at the order of an aristo whom he had offended. For a moment his tortured body had glowed with a terrible golden light. Then there was nothing. My friend pressed my arms calmingly. Again he smiled. Come, come, Meron, don't get all worked up. It isn't his fault. Why? Look at him. Can't you see that he is a throwback, lost in this world of science and machines? Besides, his voice dropped low. It doesn't matter anymore. Man failure will no longer trouble the even tenor of the machines. I finish. A tremor of excitement seizes me. You've completed it at last? And it works? It works. I test it. When the sieve changed at midnight, kept the oncoming force outside for five minutes. It works like a charm. Great! When will you tell the consul? I've already sent the message off. You know how hard it is to get them away from their wines and their women. But they'll be here soon. But before they come, I have something to tell you. Let's go back behind the screens. As we walked toward the huge tarpaulin screen mass that bulked in the center of the great chamber, I glanced around the hall at the thousand-foot circle of seated prolats. Two hundred men and women were there. Two hundred more were sleeping in the dormitories. These were all that were left of the world's workers. Before each operative rose the serried hundreds of pure buttons, dim lit, clicking in and out under the busy finger. Above each an oval visor screen with its fleeting image brought across space the area the switches controlled. 
Every one of the ten score was watching his screen with taut attention, and listening to the voices of the machines there depicted, the metallic voices from the radio speakers broadcasting their needs. The work was going on as it had gone on for ten years, with the omnipresent threat of the death bath whipping flag, tired brains to dreary energy. The work kept going on till they dropped worn out at last in their tired seats. Only in Keston brain and in mind flamed the new hope of release. Tomorrow the work would be done. Forever. Tomorrow we would be released. To take our places in the pleasure palace. To loll at ease, breathing the sweet perfume of idleness, waited on by machines, directed by a machine. For as we stood behind the heavy canvas folds that Kesson had drawn aside there toward fifty feet above me, halfway to the arching roof and a machine that was the ultimate flowering of man's genius. Almost man form it was two tall metal cylinders supporting a larger that soared aloft till far above it was topped by a many faceted ball of transparent quartz. Again I had a fleeting but vivid impression of something baleful threatening about it. Small wonder though, for the larger cylinder the trunk of the man machines Keston had created was covered thick with dangling arms, and the light of the sanded tube that floated the screened space was reflected from the great glass head till it seemed that the thing was alive, that it was watching me till some unguarded woman would give it its chance. A long moment we stood, going again over each detail of the thing, grown so familiar through long handling as it was slowly assembled. Then my friend's voice, low pitch as was its one, dissipated the vision I was seeing. Two hours ago, Mirren, with none here but me to see, those arms were extended, each to its appointed station, and as the sensitive cells in the head received the signals from the visor screen and the radio speakers, the arms shot about the keyboards and pressed the proper buttons, just as our men are doing now. The work of the world went on without a falter, with only the master machines to drag it. Yet a year ago, when I first spoke to you of the idea, you told me it was impossible. You have won, I responded. You have taken the last step in the turning over the function of man to machines, the last step but one, routine control. It is true, cannot be exercised by this. Those fellows out there are no longer necessary, but there will still be unexpected, unforeseen emergencies that will require human intelligence to meet and cope with them. You and I, I am afraid, are still doomed to remain here and serve the machines. Kesson shook his head, while a little smile played over his sharp feathered face and a glow of pride and triumph suffused his fine dark eyes. Grumbling again, old sharper, what would you say if I told you that I have solved even that problem? I have given my master machine's intelligence. My wide-eyed, questioning stare must have conveyed my thought to him, for he laughed shortly and said, <laughs> No, I've not gone insane. It was an accident, he went on with amazing calm. My first idea was merely to build something that would reduce the necessary supervisory force to one or two humans. But when I had almost completed my second experimental model, I found that I was out of the copper filaments necessary to find a certain coil. I didn't want to wait till I could obtain more from the stores, and remember that on the inside of the door of the death bath was some fine screening that could be dispensed with. I used the wire from that. Whether the secret of life as well as of death lies in those waves rise from the sun, or whether some unknown elements of the human consumed in the flame was deposited on the screening in a sort of visible coating, I do not know, but this I do know. When that second model was finished and the fatalizing current was turned on, things happened, clear things that could be explained only on the ground that the machines had intelligence. He fell silent a moment, then his thin pale lips twitched and wry smile. You know, Maren, 
I was a little scared. The thing I had created seemed possessed of a violent antagonism toward me. Look! He bared an arm and held it out. A livid wheel ran clear round the forearm. One of the tentacles I had given it whipped around my arms like a flash. If I had not caught off the current at once, it might have squeezed through flesh and bone. The pressure was terrific. I was about to speak when from the screen nearest the entrance door a beam of green light darted out. Venice came again, once, twice, three times. Look, Chief, the signal, they're coming, the council will soon be here. They're over prompt, my message might have aroused their curiosity, but listened. I incorporated my new thought coil, as I called it, in the large master machine, but I don't know just what will happen when the current flows through that, so I sensed it. The machines will work routinely without it. There is a button that will bring it into action. Well, I shall have taken the proper precaution, I will switch it on, and then we shall see what happens. We saw sooner that Keston expected. Again the green beam flashed out. The great portal slowly opened. Through them glided the three travel cars of the Supreme Council of the Aristos. It had been almost a year since I saw them, the overlords of the world, and I had forgotten their appearance, sprawled of the glowing seals of their cushions coach, eyes closed in language boredom. They were like a huge white slugs. Swollen to tremendous size by the indolent luxuriousness of their lives, the flesh that was not concealed by the bright hued web of their robes was pasty white, and backs and folds where the shrunken muscles beneath refused support. Great poach dropped beneath swollen eyelids, full lipped, sensual mouths and pendulous cheeks merged into that great fat rolls of their chins. I shuddered. This these were the master for whom we slaved. As we bent low, the gliding cars came to rest, and a warm redolence of sweet perfume came to me from the fans softly whirling in the canopies of the Arsas hats. Strands of music rose and fell, and ceased as a flat, tired voice breathed. Rise, prolats. I strained up. The eyes of the console were now opened, little pig's eyes almost lost in the flesh about them. They glinted with a cold, inhuman cruelty. I shuddered and thought of the night of terror ten years before, and suddenly I was afraid, deathly afraid. Lednam Atuna, head of the council, spoke again. We have come with your petition. What is this matter so grave that it has led you to disturb us at our pleasures? Kesson bowed low. Your Excellency, I would not have presumed to intrude upon you for a small matter. I have so greatly ventured because I have at length solved the final step in the mechanization of the world. I have invented a master machine to operate the switchboard in this hall and replace the workers thereat. The flabby faces of the aristos betrayed not the slightest interest, not the least surprise. Only Athena spoke. Interesting. If true, can you prove your statement? Casson strode to the canvas screen and pulled a cord. The great canvas curtains rolled back. Here is the machine, my lord. His face was lit with the glow of pride of achievement. His voice had lost its reverence. Rapidly he continued. The head of this contravance is a bank of photo and sonoelectric cells. Its facet focused on one of the screens. Through a nerve system of a copper filaments, any combination of lights and sounds will actuate the proper arm, which will shoot out uh, the required bank of buttons and press the ones necessary to meet any particular demand. That is all the prolets are doing out there, and they make mistake. While my master machines cannot, the... But, let them Atena raise a languid hand. Spare us this technical explanation. They bore us. All we desire to know is that the machine will do as you say. The chief flushed and gulped. His triumph was not meeting with the acclaim he had expected, but he bowed. Very well. With your gracious permission, I shall demonstrate its operation. Atuna nodded in acquiescence. 
Keston's voice rang out in Krebs' command. Attention, prolats, cease working. The long circling load suddenly jerked around. Their flying fingers halted their eternal darts. Quickly, down to the space in the front of the door to the death bath. A rush of hurried feet. These men and women were accustomed to instant unquestioning obedience. Absolute silence. Keep clear of the floor on peril of your lives. The chief wheeled to the master machines and pressed a button. Instantly, the hundreds of dangling arms telescoped out, each to a button bang where a moment before a prolet had labored. And with a weird simulation of life, the ten fork end of each arm commands a rattling presence of the buttons. Rapidly, purposefully, the metallic fingers move over the keyboards, and on the screen we could see that the machines all over the world were continuing on their even course. Not the slightest change in their working betrayed the fact that they were now being directed by a machine instead of human beings. A great surge of admiration swept me at the marvelous accomplishment of my friend. Not so the arses, expressionless, they watch as the maze of stretching tentacles vibrate through the crowded air, yet not quite expressionless. I thought I could sense in the covered glance they cast at one another a crafty winning of the implication of these machines. A question asked and answered, a decision made. Then their spokesman turned languidly to the waiting, triumphant figure of Keston. Evidently your claims are proven. This means that the force of prolats operative are no longer necessary. Yes, your excellency. They may now be released to well-earned reward. The aristo ignored the interruption. We take it that only two will now be required to operate this control station, to supply the last modicum of human intelligence required to meet unforeseen emergencies. I saw that Keston was about to interrupt once more to tell the council of the thought coil the most unbelievable part of the miracle he had wrought, but something seemed to warn me that he should not speak. Standing behind him, I nudged him while myself replied, Yes, Your Excellency, the chief flung me a startled look, but did not correct me. From the packed craft of prolats at the other end of the hall, I could hear a murmuring. While I could not make out the word, the very tone told me that in the hearts of those very slaves new hope was rising, the same hope that glowed in Kesson's face. But I was oppressed by an unreasoning fear. Atuna was still talking in his cold, unemotional monotone. This being so, hear now our decision. Keston and Meron, you will remain here to meet all emergencies. You others, your function is done. You have done your work well. You are now no longer needed to control the machines. Therefore, he paused, and my heart almost stopped. Therefore, being no longer of value, you will be disposed of. A click sounded loud through the stunned silence. Beyond the white crowd, the huge black portal slid slowly open. A simmering radiance of glowing vapors blazed from the space beyond. Prolats, file singly into the death bath. Atuna raised his voice only slightly with the command. I glanced at Keston. He was livid with fury. Incredible as it may seem, so ingrained with the habit of obedience to the aristos in the prolats that not even a murmur to protest came from the condemned beings. The nearest man to the flaming death stepped out into the void. His doomed body flared then vanished. The next moved to his turn. But suddenly a great shout rang out. Stop! It was Kesson's voice, but so changed, so packed with fury and outrage that I scarcely recognized it. His spare, tall form was drawn tensely, straight as he shook a clenched fist at the council. He was quivering with anger, and his eyes blazed. Aristos, you do wrong. This man have served you faithfully and well. I demand for them the reward they have earned. Rest 
and leisure, and the pleasure that for ten years they have seen you enjoy while they work here for you. They have worked for you, I say, and now that I have released them, you will destroy them. Aristus, I demand justice. For the first time I saw expression on the flaccid faces of this council, surprise and astonishment that a prolet should dare dispute a Aristotle command, then a sneer twisted Athena's countenance. What is this? Who are you to demand anything from us? We spare these prolets because we need them. We need them no longer, hence they must die. What madness has seized you? Reward? Justice? For prolats, as well say we should reward the stone walls of our houses, dispense justice to the machines. Proceed, prolats! Keston made as if to spring for the Aristotle's throat. I put out a hand to stop him. An invisible shield of death rays rimmed the platform the council used. It was suicide! But suddenly he turned and sprang to the master machines. He grabs a switch lever and threw it down. A long tentacle left its keys and swished menacingly through the air. Maron, prolats, under the keyboard! came Kesson's shout. I dived to obey. Steel fingers clutched my jerkin and threw it loose as I landed with a thud against the wall. Kesson thumped alongside of me. He was breathing heavily and his face was deadly pale. Look! He gasped. Astounding Stories, 19 July 1931 The Revolt of the Machine, Part 2 Out on the floor was a shambles. I saw one snake-like arm whip around the stout form of the tuna, then tightened. A streak of agony rang through the hole. Another tentacle curled about the couch of the second aristo, pinning the occupant to it. Then couch and all were swung a hundred feet in the air to be crashed down with terrific force on the stone floor. Two arms seized the third at the same time. Too sluggish to get out of the way in time. Damn them. I heard Keston mutter. True, but not all the prolats had moved fast enough at the warning shout, cowering under the saving keyboards, shrinking from the metallic arms not quite long enough to reach them. I could count only a score. The others, but what used to describe the slaughter out there. I see it in nightmare too often. A thunder from the speakers grew till it drowned out the agonized tricks in the great hole. On the screen's horror flared all over the world. It appeared the machines had gone mad. I saw Antorka crash as a dozen air friends plunged through the crystal towers. I saw a huge dread strip the roof of from the great playhouse. A smash of the struggled crowd within the stones it plucked from an embankment. I saw untenanted land cars shooting wild through packed streets. Great ponderous tractors left the field and moved in ordered array on the panic-stricken cities. Methodically, they pursued the fleeing aristos and crushed them beneath their tread like scurrying ants. I realized that the scrapping of the tentacles reaching for us had ceased, then that the arms had all returned to the button banks. Then it dawned on me that Keston's master machines was directing all the destruction I was watching, that the intelligence he had given it was being used to divert the machines from their regular task to conquer the world. You sure started something, Keston, I said. Yes, he gasped, white-faced. Something that I should have expected when that model machines went for me. Do you understand? I've given the machines intelligence, created a new race, and they are trying to wipe out the humans, conquer the world for themselves. The possibility flashed on me when I was half mad with rage and disappointment at the callous cruelty of the Arista Council. I threw that switch with the thought that it would be far better for all of us to be wiped out. But now, I don't know. After all, they are men like ourselves, and it hurts to see our own race annihilated. If only I can get to that switch. He started to push out from under the scan shelter, but an alert tentacle hissed through the air in a swift step at him, and he dodged back hopelessly. Don't be a damn fool, I snapped at him. 
Forget that mushy sentimentality. Even even if you save the aristos, we are due for extinction just the same. Better that the whole human race be wiped up together. Then a thought struck me. Maybe we have a chance to get out of this ourselves. Impossible! Where could we hide from the machines? He waved a hand at the screen. Look! The glacier, man! The glacier! He started. There are no machines out there. If we can get to the ice, we are safe. But the aircraft will find us. They don't know we are there. There are no microphones or radio eyes in the waste. A rough voice came from the covering files behind us. Hey, Keston, let's get a move. You're the smart guy around here. Get us out of this mess you've started. It was Abbott. When so many better pilots had perished, he was alive and whole. We got out, crawling under the keyboard till we could make a dash for the door. We emerged into a world ablaze with light of many fires and reverberating with the far off crashing of destruction. To the right, we could see the tumbled remains of what a short hour before had been our barracks. Two digging machines were still ponderously moving about among the ruins, pounding down their heavy buckets methodically, reducing the concrete structure to a horrible dead level. Ten score prolats had been sleeping there when I left. As we rushed into the open, the machines turned and made for us, but they had not been built for speed, and we easily outdistanced them. The rest of that day will always remain a dim haze to me. I can remember running and running, Abbott's broad form always in the lead. I can remember long minutes of trembling under tangled underbrush, while from above sounded the brewing of an air machine searching ceaselessly for us. I can remember seeing at last the tall white ramparts of the glacier, then the blackness swallowed me up, hands tugged at me, and I knew no more. The great white waste of Himaki eyes dazzled under the blinding sun. My eyes were hurting terribly. There was a great void in my stomach. For two days I had not eaten. Keston, tottering weakly at my side, was in an even worse state. His trembling hand could scarcely hold the primitive bone's tip spear. God knows I had difficulty enough with mine. Yet tired, hungry, shivering as we were, we forced our dragging feet along, searching the interminable expanse for sign of polar bear or the wild white dogs that hunted in packs. We had to find flesh, any kind of flesh, to feed our cheerful stomachs or go under. Keston uttered a weak shout. I looked from behind a frozen hummock a great white bear padded. He saw us, sniffed the air a moment, then turned contemptuously away. He must have sensed our weakness. Almost crying in his eagerness, Keston raised his spear and cast it with what strength he had at the animal that meant food and warmth for our bodies. The weapon described a slow arc and caught the shaggy bear flush in the shoulder. But there had been no force behind the throw. The sharpened bone tip stuck in the flesh, quivered a bit, and dropped harmlessly to the ice. Aroused, the crater reeled about. We caught a glimpse of small, finding tip eyes. Then, with a roar, it made for us. Look out! I cried. Keston started to run, but I knew he couldn't match the wounded animal in speed. I threw my futile spear, but the bear shook it off as though it were a pinprick and would not be diverted from his prey. I ran after, shouting for help. Then Keston stumbled and went down in a sprawl on the rough, gray ice. The bear was almost on him, and there was nothing I could do. Then the figure of a man darted from behind a sheltering mound. It was Abbott, swathed in warm white furs, brawny of body, strong, well fed, heavy jolt. He swung easily a long spear, far heavier than ours, and pointed with keen barbs. He stopped short at the sight of us, and his brutal features contorted in merriment. The desperate plight of my friend seemed to afford him infinite amusement, nor did he make any move to help. I shouted to him, Quick, kill it before it's too late! So it is Abbott you turn now, he sneered heavily. Abbott, whom you thought deserving of the death bath not so long ago? <laughs> no, my fine friends, let me see you help yourself. You two who thought you were kingpins down in the folly? Men, <laughs> weaklings, that's all you are. 
I ran blindly over the uneven ice, unarmed, some crazy notion in my mind of tackling the brute with bare fist to drag him off my friend. Abbott shouted with laughter, leaning on his spear. For some strange animal reason, the mocking laughter enraged the bear. He had almost reached the motionless figure of Keston when he swerved suddenly and made for Abbott. The ghastly merriment froze on the heavy jolt man. Like lightning, he lifted his heavy lance and drove it with a powerful arm squarely into the breast of the advancing brute. It sunk a full foot into the blubbery face, and while the stricken bear clawed finally at the wound and sought to push himself along toward the man, Abbott held the spear firmly as in a vice, so that the animal literally impaled itself. With a gush of blood, it sank motionlessly to the ground. Abbott plucked the spear away with a dexterous twist. Keston was feebly groping to his feet. I was torn between joy at his deliverance and rage at the inhuman callousness of Abbott. The latter grinned at us hatefully. You see what poor weakling creatures you are, he jeered. Good for nothing but to push a lot of senseless bun. Down there you were the bosses, the one to look upon me as a dirt. Here, on the ice where it takes God to get along. I am the boss. I let you live on my scrubs and leavings, simply because it tickled me to see you cring and beck. But I am growing weary of that sport. Henceforth, you keep away from my camp. Don't let me catch you prowling around. Do you hear? Let's see how long you last on the ice. And this animal is mine, he prodded the carcass. I kill it. I'll make the prolet skin and cut it up for me. <laughs> How they cring and obey me, Abbott the dull one. <laughs> On this he strode away, still laughing thunderously. I looked to Kesson in blank dismay. What was to be our fate now, but death by cold and slow starvation? Three months had passed since we had escaped to the ice from the dreadful machines a score of us. For a while it seemed that we had fled in vain, we were not fit to cope with the raw essentials of life. It was uncounted centuries since men fought nature barehanded, so we huddled together for warmth and starved. Even Kesson's keen brain was helpless in this waste of ice, without tools, without machines. Then it was that Abbott rose to take command. He, Dool brought that he was amid the complexities of our civilization, fairly reveled in this primitive combat with hunger and cold. He was an anachronism in our midst and a throwback to our early forebears. It did not take him long to fashion cunning nooses and traps to catch the few beasts that roam the ice. Once he pounced upon a wolf-like creature and strangled it with bare hands. He fashioned with ab fingers spears and barbs of bone, curved knife from sin bones, and skinned the heavy fur pelts and made them into garments. No wonder the prolats in their helplessness looked at him as their leader. Keston and I were thrust aside, but Abbott did not forget. He slow with and mine harbored that leader and curve for former days, when we were in command. He remembered our contempt for his slow, dull process, for the many errors he was guilty of. By a queer quick, the very fact that Keston had saved him from the death death on several occasions, but fed the flames of his hatred. Perhaps that was an ancient human trait, too. So he set himself to twit and humiliate us. His jibes were heavy-handed and gross. He refused to let us eat at the communal mess, but forced us to wait until all were true, when he tossed us a few scraps as though we were dogs. Many times I started up in hot rage, ready to match with my softened muscles against his brown. But always, Kesson caught me in time and whispered patience. Some plan was taking shape in his mind, I could see. So I stopped short and was content to bide my time. Now we were true, discarded as a last brutal gesture. What was there to be done now? In utter silence, I looked at Keston. To my great surprise, he did not seem downcast. Quite the contrary. His eyes were sparkling, once more alive with the red fire. The weariness was gone from him. There was energy, decision stamped on his finely cut features. Now it's our time to act, he said. I've been hesitating too long. What are you talking about? Abbott forced my hand, Kesson explained. You didn't think we were going to live here in the vision of the rest of our lives? 
I'd rather die now than have such a future staring me in the face. No, we're going down into folly to fight the machines. I stared at him aghast. Man, you're crazy. They crush us in a minute. Maybe, he said unconcernedly. But we have no time to lose. Abbott will be back with the prolats and we'll have to clear out before then. Quick, cut off a few chunks of meat. We'll need them. But Abbott will kill us when he finds out what had been done. And we'll starve if we don't. Which was an un unswearable argument. So with our bone knives, we hacked off gobs of the still warm flesh covered with great layers of fat. Looking up from my toss, I saw black figures coming down towards us from the direction of the camp. They quickened into a run even as I noticed them, Abbott and the prolats. Quick, Keston, I cried. They are coming. Keston glanced around and started to run. I followed as fast as I could. They'll catch us, I panted. Where, where can we hide? Down the folly. But the missions will get us then. Save your breath and follow me. I know a place. We were racing along as fast as our weakened legs could carry us, toward the edge of glacier. I looked back to see Abbott, his brute face distorted with rage, gaining rapidly on us. The other prolats were being out distance. Abbott shouted threateningly for us to stop, but that only made us redouble our efforts. I knew he would kill us if he caught up with us. He had his spear and we were without ours. The step terminus of the great northern glacier hove into view. Far below was the broad, fertile, habitable belt, stretching as far as the eye could see. A lump rose in my throat as I ran. It was our earth, our heritage down there, and here we are, fleeing for our lives, disposed by bits of metals and quartz, machines that we had fashioned. Hovering in the air on the level with us were scout planes, vigilance guardians of the frontier. Once a prolet had become crazed by the eternal ice and cold and had ventured down the side of the glacier to reach the warm lands his thin blood hungered for, as soon as he had painfully clambered to the bottom, within the area of the televisor, a plane had swooped and crushed him, while we, leaning the age, had witnessed the horror helplessly. Yet Caston ran on confidently. Abbott was just a little way behind, bellowing exultantly. When we came to the jumping-off place, he was sure he had us now. Keston slid from view. It was sheer suicide to go down there. I knew, yet to man where I was, man certain death. Abbott's spear was already poised to thrust. There was only one thing to do, and I did it. I threw myself over the rim, just where Keston had disappeared. I landed with a thud on a narrow ledge of ice. The surface was glassy smooth, and I started slipping straight toward the outer edge. A sheer drop a thousand feet to the folly below. I strove to recover my balance, but only accelerated my progress. Another moment and I would have plunged into the abyss, but a hand reached out and grabbed me just in time. It was Keston. Hold tight and follow me, he whispered urgently. We have no time to lose. The master machine is seeing us now in the fissure screen and will act. I had an impulse to turn back, but Abbott's face was luring down at us. I'll get you for this, he screamed and let himself down heavily over the ledge. Cason edged his way along the treacherous trail. I after him. It was ticklish work, a misstep, and there would be nothing to break our fall. I heard a siren sound, then another, and another. I wasted a precious moment to look up. A scout plane was diving for us on a terrific slant. The air was black with aircraft converging on us. The master machine had seen us. I sensed utter malevolence in the speed of these senseless metals, thrown at us by the thing my friend had created. But there was no time for thought. In desperate haste, we inched our way along. Abbott had seen the peril, too and lost all his truculence in the face of the greater danger. He clawed after us, intent only on reaching whatever safety we were heading for. I could hear the zoom of the great wings when the path took a sudden turn and we catapulted headlong into a black cavern thrusting into the ice. We were not an instant too soon, for a giant shape swooped by our covert with a terrifying swoosh inch away from Abbott's leg as he dived after us, and it was followed by a grinding crash. The machine had been directed too close to the ice and had smashed into bits. 
We crouched there in a moment, panting, struggling to regain our wine. Keston had regained the air of quiet power he had once possessed. Quietly, he spoke to our enemy. Listen to me, Abbott. Up there on the ice, you played the bully, relying on your brute strength. Here, however, we are up against the machines, and your intelligence is off to low an order to compete with them. You need my brains now. If you expect to escape from them and live, you'll have to do exactly as I say. I am boss. Do you understand? I expected a roar of rage at Kesson's calm assertion, and quietly got in back of Abbott ready to jump him if he made a threatening move. But the big brute was a creature of abject terror staring out with the fear-haunted eyes. Quite humbly, he replied, You are right. You are the only one who can beat the machines. I will follow you in everything. Very well, then. This cave leads through a series of tunnels down through the ice to the bottom of the folly. I explored it nights when you were sleeping. I looked at him in amazement. I had not known anything about his midnight wanderings. He saw my glance. I'm sorry, Maren, but I thought it wiser to say nothing of my plans, even to you, until it had mattered, let us go. Outside, hundreds of craft were halting across the opening. Escape that way was clearly impossible. No doubt the master machine is hurrying off her high explosive to blast us out, Kesson said indifferently, but we won't be here. We started down a tortuous decline, crawling on hands and knees. We had not progressed very far when we heard a thud and roar behind us, followed by a series of crashes. Just as I thought, the master machine is firing terminite into the cavern. What a high degree of intelligence that thing has. Too bad we'll have to smash it, he sighed. I fairly believe he hated to destroy this brain child of his. Yet just how he was going to do it, I did not know. There pass hours of weary, torturing, stumbling, and slithering, and sudden falls down, always down, interminably. A pale glimmering showed us the way, a dim shining through the icy walls. At last, faint with toil, bleeding, and torn from glass-sharp splinters, we reach a level chamber, faulted, surprisingly, with solid rock. It was good to see something of the earth again, something that was not that deadly, all-embracing ice. At the far end lay a blinding patch. I blinked. Sunlight! I shouted joyously. Yes, Kesson answered quietly. That opening leads directly into the folly on our land. Abbott roused himself from the unreasoning dread he had been in. It was the first time he had spoken. Let us get out of here. I feel as though I am in a tomb. Are you mad? Kesson said sharply. The visor will pick you at once. You won't last very long. Abbott stopped suddenly. There was a plaintive, helpless nod to him. But we can't stay here forever. We starve or die of cold. Isn't there some way to get back to the top of the glacier? No, only the way we came. And that's been blocked with terminite. Then what are we going to do? You fled us into slow death, you with your boasted brains. That remains to be seen, was the calm retort. In the meantime, we were hungry. Let us eat. And the amazing man drew out of his torn flapping first the gobs of meat he had cut from the dead bear. I had quite forgotten them. With a glad cry, I threw reach into my garments and brought out my supply. Abbott's eye glinted evilly. His hand stole stealthily to the bone knife in its skin sheath. His spear had been dropped long before. None of that. Kesson said sharply, we will all share equally, even though you have no food, but if you try to hog it all, or use force, you will die as well as we. There are only enough for a meal or two, and then what will you do? Abbott saw that, he needed Kesson's brains. His eyes dropped and he mumbled something about our misunderstanding his gesture. We let it go at that, we had to. He could have killed us both if he wished, so we divided our food with painstaking fairness. How we gorged in the raw red flesh and thick greasy fat. Food that would have disgusted us when we lived and worked in the central station now was ambrosia to our sharpened appetites. When not the least scrub was left, and we had slacked our thirst with chunks of ice off from the cavern floor, I spoke. What is that plan you spoke of, Kesson? for reconquering the earth from the machines 
Abud looked up abruptly at my question, and it seems to me that a crafty smile glinted in the small pig eyes. Keston hesitated a moment before he spoke. I confess my plan have been materially impeded by the sudden predicament we find ourselves in. Thanks to our good friends here. He ironically indicated Abbott. The big prolet merely granted. However, Keston continued, I'll have to make the best of circumstances. Without the aid of certain materials that I had expected to assemble, the idea is a simple one. You've noted no doubt how the terminus of the glacier opposite the central control station overhangs. The brow, over a thousand feet up, extends out at least hundred feet beyond the base. Astounding Stories, 19 July 1931 The Revolt of the Machines by Nat Schachner and Arthur L. Zagat, Part 3 I nodded assent, though a bit seemed startled. Many times had Keston and I speculated on the danger of an avalanche at this point, and wondered why the station had been built in such an exposed place. Once indeed we had ventured to suggest to the Arista Council the advisability of removing the central control to some other point, but the cold silence that greeted our diffidence advice deterred us from further pursuit of the subject. Now you know as well as I, Keston resumed. That a glacier is merely a huge river of ice, and though solid partakes of some of qualities of freely flowing waters, as a matter of fact, glaciers do flow, because the tremendous pressure at the bottom lowers the melting point of ice to such a degree that the ice actually liquefies and flows along. I followed him eagerly in these elementary statements, trying to glimpse what he was driving at, but Abbott's brute features were fixed in a blank stare. This glacier does move, we've measured it a matter of an inch or two a day, if, however, Kesson's voice took a, on a deeper note. We can manage to hasten that process. The glacier will overwhelm the countryside. He paused, and that gave me a chance to interpose some objection. But hold a moment. In the first place, it is an absolute impossibility with the means at our command, or even with every appliance, to melt the face of the whole northern glacier. In the second place, even if we could, the whole world would be overwhelmed, and then where would we be? Kesson looked at me a trivial scornfully. Who said we were going to melt the entire glacier? Remember I spoke only of the place of the overhang, set that in motion, and we don't have to worry about the problem any further. Why not? I inquired incredulously. Suppose you do wipe out all the machines in this particular vicinity, won't there be tremendous numbers left all through the equatorial belt? Of course, he explained patiently. And what if they are? What are all these machines but inanimate mach mechanisms, things of metal and rubber and quartz? What makes them the monster they have become? I smote my forehead in anger. What a fool! Now I see it. It's the master machines you are after. Exactly, he smilingly agreed. Overwhelm, destroy this devilish creature of mine with its unhuman intelligence, and the machines are what they were before, merely obedient slaves. I pondered that at moment. And how, may I ask, are you going to force this old glacier to move? His face clouded. That's the trouble. Up on the ice, I was working on that problem and had managed secretly to rig up a contrivance that would have done the trick. But we can't go back for it. That way is blocked, he mused half to himself. If only we could lay our hands on a solar disintegrating machine, that difficulty would be solved. At the name, Abut's face had, had been a study in blank incomprehension. Lit up. Solar disintegrating machine, he inquired. Why, there's one station not more than a few hundred yards away from here. This area, 2RX, was my sector, you know. Of course, of course, shouted Kesson. I'd quite forgotten the very thing. You're not half bad, Abbott. If you'd only stop trying to rely on brute strength instead of brains, he concluded. Abbott said nothing, but I noticed a quick flash of hatred that passed in an instant, leaving a blank countenance. I thought to myself, you'll be watching, my van fellow. I don't trust you at all. Kesson was speaking. 
We'll have to wait until nightfall. The master machines won't expect us down at the base, so I'm positive the search ray won't be focused along the ground. We'll sneak to the machines, smash it visor and the radio unit so it won't give the alarm and haul it back. Then I'll show you what next to be done. Night came at last, leaden footed though we were burning with impatience. Very softly we crawled out of the cave, three shadows. Unfortunately, there was no moon. The great glacier loomed ominously above us, dimly white. Hide overhead hovered the green signal lights of the machine's planes. Their search ray focused in blinding glares on the rim of the upper ice. It did not take us long to find the dark bulk of the instigator. It was a squat cylinder, for all the world like a huge boiler. At one end, there upended a periscope arrangement which burned out to a funnel. In the funnel was a very powerful lens, cut to special measurements. The light of the sun, or any light for that matter, was concentrated through the lens onto a series of photoelectric cells, composed of an alloy of selenium and a far more delicate element, elenium. A high tension current was there created of such powerful intensity that it disintegrated the atoms of every element except osmium and indium into their constituent electrons. Consequently, the interior as well as the long slit nozzle orifice at the other end were made of these resistant metals. Through a special process, the tremendously powerful current was forced through the wide-angled nozzle in the spreading tin plate ray that sheared through earth and rock and metals as if they were butter. Such was the machines we were after. It was but the work of a few seconds to smash the delicate television and sonar boxes placed on the top of every machine. Now we were sure no warning could be given the master machines as it sat in its metallic cunning at the control board, ceaselessly receiving its messages from the area apparatus focused above it. Quietly, very quietly, we trundled the precious instruments along on its wheelbase. The green lights dot the sky above, the search ray were firmly set on the rim. At last, without any untoward alarm, we reached the welcome shelter of the base. But not as I had expected. Back to our tunnel. On the contrary, Keston, who had directed the party, had led us almost a quarter mile away. I looked up again and understood. The great overhang of the glacier was directly above us. Without a word, with hardly a sound, we trundled the, the instigator into a natural niche we found in the icy surface. It was almost completely hidden, only the funnel with its lens protruded into the open. The nozzle orifice was pointing directly at the interior of the ice pack. Now everything is set properly, Kasten remarked with satisfaction as he sprang up from adjusting the various control of the machine. When the first ray of the morning sun strikes the lens, the instigator will start working. It will shear through a layer of ice over a radius of at least a mile. That huge crevasse, coupled with the terrific heat and the pressure from the mountain of ice above, will start the whole glacier moving, or I'll be very much mistaken. Come, let us get back to our shelter before the alarm is given. As he started to move, a dark bulk loomed ominously in front of us. Abbott, his voice was harsh, forbidding. Do you mean to say nothing further is to be done here? That the disintegrator will work without any attention? This is just what I said, Kasson replied, somewhat surprised. Step aside, Abbott, and let us go. It is dangerous to remain here. But Abbott made no move to comply. Instead, he thrust back his great shaggy hat and gave in to a resounding laugh. <laughs> My fine friends, so you were the brainy one, eh? And Abbott, the obedient Dulwit again, how nicely you've been fooled. I waited until you accommodatingly evolved the plan to reconquer the world and put it into the effect. Now that you've done so, I've no further need for you. The voice that heavily tried to be mocking now snarled. You poor fools, don't you know that with you out of the way, I, Abbott, will be the lord of the world? Those prolats up there know better than to disobey me. Do you mean you intend to kill us? Kasson asked incredulously. 
So you've actually grasped the idea, was the sarcastic retort. Meanwhile, I was gradually edging to the side, my hand reaching for the bone knife in my bosom. Abbott saw my movement. No, you don't. He roared and sprang for me, his long, gleaming knife uplift. I tugged desperately at my weapon, but it was entangled in the braid first. In a moment he was on top of me. Involuntarily, I raised my arm to ward off the threatened blow, raging my despair in my heart. The point fell, but Kesson struck at the savage arm with all his might, deflecting the blade just in time. It seared my shoulder like a red-hot iron, and in the next instant, all three of us were rolling, kicking, snarling trio of animals. We fought desperately in the dark. There were no rules of the game. Biting, gogging, kicking, everything went. Kesson and I... Weakened as we were from long starvation and the biting cold, were no match for our powerful, huge muscle opponent, well clad and well nourished as he was. Though we fought with the strength of despair, a violent blow from his huge fist knocked Kesson out of the fight. Hairy fingers grasped my throat. I'll break your neck for you. He snarled, and his hands tightened. I struggled weakly, but I was helpless. I could just see his hateful face grinning at my contortions. I was passing out, slowly, horribly. Kesson was still motionless. Colored lights danced before my eyes, little spots that flared and died out in crashing blackness. Then the whole world leaped into flaming white, so that my eyeballs hurt in the dim recesses of my pain-swept mind. I thought that strangulation must end like this. The brightness held dazzlingly. But suddenly, a fiercest pain swept into my consciousness. The pain of gasping breath forcing air through tortured gullets into suffocating lungs. I struggled up into the fierce illumination. From a sitting position, I saw Abbott, now clearly visible as in midday, craning his head way back. I looked too, and in spite of my stabbing gasp for air, jumped to my feet. The search ray from the scout planes were focused directly on us. I knew what that meant. The sight of us was even the being cast upon the two or X visor screens in the central control station. The devilous master machine was even the manipulating the proper buttons. We had not a second to lose. My strangled throat hurt horribly, but I managed to hoarse yell. Run! And I tottered to where Caston yet lay, bathed in the deadly illumination, unmoving. There was a snarl of animal fear from Abbott, and he started to run, wildly, with never a backward glance at us. Even in my own fear, expecting each instant the crash of terminite about me, I managed to hurl a last word at the feeling figure. Coward! That will with my feelings considerably. I tottered over and tugged at Kasten. He was limp. I look up, hundreds of planes were converging overhead. The night was a crisscross of stabbing search rays. I lift my friend and slung him across my shoulder. Every exertion, every move was accompanied by excruciating agony, but I persevered. Abbott was already halfway to the tunnel, running like mad. Then what I had dreaded happened. There came a swoosh through the night, a dull thud. A blinding flash and a roar that paled the search ray into insignificance. The first terminite bomb had been dropped. For a moment the landscape was filled with flying rocks and huge chunks of ice. When the great clouds of finally upthrown earth had settled, there was no sign of Abbott. He had been directly in the path of the explosion. Staggering under my load, I headed as close to the ice pack as I could. There was no safety out in the open. I groaned heavily past the disintegrator, whose very existence I had forgotten in the crash of events. A sizzling hum, a thin eddy of steam, halted me in my tracks. I stared. The machines was working. Even as I watched, a great wedge was momentarily being driven further and further into the ice. A great fan-shaped wedge, clouds of steam billowed up, growing thicker and heavier. A rushing stream of unleashed water was lapping at my feet. 
I was bewildered, frankly so. What had started the disintegrate of the in the dead of night? Of course! I shouted exultantly to the limb body on my shoulder. For a search ray was fixed steadily on the funnel. There it was. From that blinding light, the machine was getting the energy it needed. If only the visor did not disclose that little bit of metal to the unwinking master machine. I looked again and took heart. It was almost undistinguishable against the dazzling blur of ice in the fierce white light. If those rays held, the salvation of the world was assured. There was only way to do it. I shrunk at my own thoughts. Yet there was no alternative. It must be done. I was hidden from the rays under a projection of ice. Terminite bombs were dropping methodically over a rapidly devastated sector with methodically regularity. Sooner or later, the master machine would feel that we were exterminated, and the search rays switch off. That would mean that the disintegrator would cease working, and the whole plan fall through. In the morning light, the sector signaling apparatus, at the first sign of renewed activity, would give warning, and the unhuman thing of metal at the controls would discover and wreck our last hope. No. I must walk boldly into the bombed area and discover myself as alive in the visor of the planes and make them continue to bomb and throw their search ray on the scarred plane. That means the disintegrator will receive the vital light. But how about Keston? I couldn't leave him there on the ground motionless while I deserted him. Nor could I take him with me. I was prepared to take my chance with almost certain death, but I could not trivial with his life so. I was in an agony of indecision. Just then the form of my aching shoulder steered side struggled a bit and suddenly slid down to a standing position. Kesson swayed unsteadily a moment, straightened, looked about him in amazement. What's happening here? he demanded. Why, you old war horse, I shouted in my relief. I thought you were out of the pictures completely. Not me. He answered indignantly. I'm all right, but you haven't answered my question. A terminite bomb exploded not so far away from where we stood. I ducked involuntarily, Keston doing likewise. There's the answer, I grinned, and a rather neat one too, but I'll explain. In a few words, I sketched what had happened and showed him the disintegrator spreading its deadly wave of destruction. By now, there was a torrent enveloping us up to our knees. We would have to move soon or be drowned in the slowly rising water. Then, hesitatingly, I told him of my scheme to keep the search ray in action. His lean face sobered, but he nodded his head bravely. Of course. That is the only way to keep them at it. You and I will start at once, in separate directions, so that if they get one, the other will continue to draw the search ray down on the plane, and into the disintegrator. Not you, Keston, I dissented in alarm. Your life is too valuable. Your brain and skill will be needed to remodel the world and make it habitable for the few prolats that are left after the machines are wiped out. You are just as valuable a man as I am, he lied affectionately. No, my mind is made up. We chance this together. And to all my pleadings he was obdurate, insisting that we each take an equal risk. I gave in at last with a little choke in my throat. We shook hands with a steady grip and walked out into the glare of light on divergent path. Would I ever see my friends again? There was a pause of second as I walked on and on, came down an earth-shattering crash that flung me to the ground. The visors had caught the pictures of me. I picked myself up, bruised and sore, but otherwise unharmed. I started to run. The sky was a blast of zooming plants that hurled destruction on the land below. Far off could be heard the rumbling roar of hurrying machines, tractors, diggers, disintegrators, levers, all the mighty mobile masses of the metal that man's brain had conceived all hurrying forward in the mass attack to seek out and destroy their creators, obedient to the will of a master machine, immobile pressing buttons in the central control system. 
The night resolved itself into a weird phantasmagoric nightmare for me, a gigantic game of hide and seek in which I was it, gasping, choking, flung to earth and stunned by ear shattering explosion, staggering up somehow, ducking to avoid being crushed beneath the ponderous threat of metal's monster that clung uncannily for me. So being loud in terror, swerving just in time from in front of a swinging crane, instinctively sidestepping just as a pale violet ray swept into nothingness all before it. I must have been delirious, for I retain only the vaguest memory of the horror. And all of the time the guiding search ray biased down upon the torn and shattered field, and the disintegrator, unnoticed in the fast uproar, steadily kept up its deadly work. At last, in my delirium and terror, I heard a great rending and tearing. I look up, and a tractor just missed me as it rolled by on swishing threads. But that one glance was enough. The ice cap was moving, flowing forward, a thousand foot wall of ice. Great billowing clouds of steam spurt from innumerable cracks. The deed had been done, the world was safe for our mankind. Summoning the last ounce of strength, I set off on a steady run for a cellar of the rock cave, to be out of the way when the final smash-up came. I was not pursued. The ponderous machines, thousands of them, were hastily forming into solid ranks directly in front of the tottering glacier wall. The master machines had seen an impending fate in its visor, and was organizing a defense. Even in my elation, I could not but feel unwilling admiration for this monstrous thing of metal and quartz, imbued with an intelligence that could think more coolly and quickly than most humans. Yet I did not stop running until I reached the cave. My heart gave a great bound. For there, peering anxiously with worn face into the groaning dawn, stood the figure of Keston, my friend whom I had never expected to see alive again. Maron, he shouted, is it you or your ghost? That very question I was about to ask you, I parried. But look, old friend, see what your genius has accomplished and is now destroying. The mountain of ice was flowing forward, gathering speed on the sway. At an invisible signal, the mass machines, thousand on thousand of them, started into action. Like shocked troops in a last desperate assault, they ground forward, a serried line that exactly paralleled the threatened break, and hundred deep. This old earth of us had never witnessed so awe-inspiring a sight. They smashed into that moving wall of ice with the force of uncounted millions of tons. We could hear the groaning and straying of furiously turning machinery as they heaved. Keston and I looked at each other in amazement. The master machine was trying to hold back the mighty glacier by the sheer power of its cohorts. A wild light sprang into Keston's eyes of admiration, of regret. What a thing is this that I created, he muttered. If only... I truly believe that for a moment he half desired to see his brainchild triumph. The air was hideous with a thousand noises. The glacier wall was cracking and splitting with the noise of thunderclaps. The machines were rearing and banging and crashing. It was a gallant effort. But the towering ice wall was not to be denied. Forward, ever forward, it moved pushing inexorably the struggling machine before it, piling them up high upon one another, grinding into powder to the front ranks. And to cap it all, the huge overhang, a thousand feet high, was swaying crazily and describing ever greater arcs. Look! I screamed and flung up my arm. Great freight planes were flying wing to wing, head on for the tottering crack, deliberately smashing into the topmost point. Trying to knock it back into equilibrium, said Keston, eyes ablaze, dancing about insanely. But the last suicidal push did not avail. With screams as of a thousand devils and a deafening rending roars, the whole side of the glacier seemed to lean over and fall in a great earth-shattering crescendo of noise. While we watched, fascinated, rode to the ground, that thousand feet of glittering wall described a tremendous arc, swinging with increasing momentum down, down, down to the earth it had so long been separated from. 
The clamoring machines were buried under, lost in a swirl of ice and snow. Only the central station remained, a few moments divined under the swift onrush of its unfleeing foe. With a crash that could have been heard around the world, the uppermost crack struck the station. The giant glacier wall was down. The earth, the sky, the universe was filled with ice, broken, shattered, torn, splintered, vaporized. The ground beneath our feet heaved and tumbled in violent quake. We were thrown heavily, and I knew no more. I weltered out of a consciousness. Kasson was caving my hand and rubbing my forehead with ice. He smiled wanly to find me still alive. Weak and battered, I struggled to my feet. Before me was a wilderness of ice, a new mountain range of gigantic tumbled blocks of dazzling purity. Of the embattled machines, of the central control station, there was not a sign. They were buried forever under hundreds of feet of frozen water. I turned to Kasson and shook his hand. You've won! You've saved the world! Now let's get the prolet and start to rebuild! There was no trace of exultation in Kesson's voice. Instead, he, unaccountably, sighed as we trot up a narrow winding path to the top. Yes, he said half to himself. I've done it, but... But what? I asked curiously. That beautiful wonderful machines i created he burst forth in sudden passion to think that it should lie down there destroyed a twisted mass of scrap metals and broken glass